For three days now, the fighting for the Bezimianaya Hill had been going on with unrelenting vigour. There was only one consulacli, along with the increasing losses in the Sekoslovak corps. The enemy's losses were also increasing. There was no news from Soho. In the evening I received a call from Engel, who happily informed me that Soho had captured a tongue, some Ober-Ephriator, and the German had already been sent to me. The Major always understood us well. My fatigue was lifted like a hand. I had to quickly adjust myself to the meeting with the prisoner. As for interrogation in general, I knew something about it, but how to find the keys to the prisoner so that he would tell the truth was another matter. What if there should happen to be one who would tell a tale seven versts to heaven? Then you'll have to sort it out. And what to do with a Nazi who is devoured by pathological hatred of the enemy and animal fear of the answer? Now spill everything you can to get the German to give you the information you need, I told myself. By brute violence it was unlikely that confessions could be extracted, and to hope that the prisoner will tell the whole truth is also illusory. If he only distorts his testimony a little, the enemy's bunkers, trenches, machine-gun nests, minefields and other obstacles, which are mostly unknown to us and which we vainly try to destroy, will remain hidden and will continue to mow down our fighters. Only artillery fire directed at targets accurately known from our own reconnaissance or from the testimony of prisoners can suppress and destroy them. Unfortunately, our intelligence has lost many of its best scouts. It happens, however, that prisoners sometimes give more valuable information than their own intelligence. Ober Ephraeta can answer questions as if in confession, or he can simulate and make up. Deliberate inaccuracies in information about the location of firing targets will be disastrous for us in such a case. Every man has his psychological and moral weaknesses, his vulnerabilities, so that there are very few prisoners who refuse to talk at all. It is unlikely that a German prisoner would be an active anti-fascist. It would also be foolish to assume that a German would talk without much difficulty and immediately tell the whole truth, thus providing us with invaluable information. I was anxious to meet the prisoner. At the same time I felt something in me revolting against him, although I had not yet seen him. It seemed to me that everything was going to be unexpectedly easy and simple, and then I was again troubled. I realized that the task ahead of me was more difficult and delicate than any I had had to solve so far. I was not a professional in this business and I was going to influence a possibly hardened fascist and thug with just some psychology. I knew that professionals did not rely much on psychological influence. However, the consciousness that the terrible bloodshed on the heights would stop if I succeeded in interrogating the prisoner strengthened my resolve to throw myself into a bloodless battle with the prisoner. For the umpteenth time I reminded myself that I must approach the prisoner with understanding, master my feelings and make the most of the critical moments when his doubts would overwhelm him and his resistance would weaken. Of course I could achieve nothing if I did not get into his soul. My efforts would be utterly in vain if I did not win the prisoner's confidence. This was my reasoning, but my optimism wavered again and again at the thought that philosophy and psychology would not go far. What are they against a rabid Nazi? I never came to a final decision on how to behave with the prisoner. At last in the anteroom I heard rough voices and the stomping of boots. The chief of the escort entered the room with an envelope in his hand. The prisoner stood in the doorway, erect, as if frozen. He hesitated before entering, wiped his boots on the threshold, but then stepped firmly and confidently into the room. The prisoner was tall, with a pleasant appearance. Bond hair, dark eyebrows, an expression of sadness on his face. He had a miserable appearance. Veer in the mud, dried clay falling from him to the floor, he was all wet. His right cheek was swollen. A streak stretched from the corner of his lips to his ear. Faces of dried blood could be seen on his dirty hands. His torn overcoat hung down pathetically. I read the message and glanced at the German from time to time. He looked at me directly. There was a tense silence. And where did you, Fritz, go? Who did you not make happy with your presence? Before you came to this abandoned shack on the Sikoslovak border near Dukla. The thought occurred to me. The German stood looking grim. In his cheekbones, his jowls were playing up. I tried to understand his condition. He looked at me resolutely, as if he wanted to say that he was ready for anything. Then he looked round the room absent-mindedly and stopped his gaze on the old wooden cross on the wall. The wooden Christ was weathered and the varnish had worn off in places. Crucified, he hung tiredly on the cross with his head tilted to the side and his eyes closed, as if he were only now dying a martyr's death.
The prisoner looked at this old cross, the work of the folkwood carvers, with a frozen gaze. A deep silence reigned throughout the house. It was becoming unbearable. Uber if Lieutenant. That's right. He answered clearly and stood at attention, his face strangely frozen. Name. Ones, shalt say. Occupation? No. Teacher. Age. Nitty two years old. Marital status. Married. I have a son. Waiting for the next question. The German concentrated, but I remained silent. He coughed and looked at the cross again. I sat back in my chair, the German soldier's hands dangling awkwardly in front of my eyes, his fingers tensely clenched and unclenched, while he himself sat perfectly still. Never before had I said that fingers could give away a man's state of mind in such a way. The silent game continued. I watched the German closely. There was a tense silence. Beech logs crackled and hissed in the cooker. The prisoner's hands froze, his fingers remained clenched, and there was a feverish gleam in his eyes. I felt that he wanted to tell me something. Without waiting for my question, the prisoner nodded his head in the direction of the cross, and, to my surprise, said, Beautiful folk art. An artist. No, he said, becoming bolder. My father is a woodcarver. He works on religious themes. There was silence again. I waited tensely to see what else he would say. We both looked at each other inquisitively. He looked worried. Now you are in an unpleasant position. I said rather sharply, knowing for certain that he would respond. The prisoner slowly raised his eyes, shrugged his shoulders, and shook his head slightly. Droplets of sweat appeared on his upper lip. What are you going to do to me? He asked quietly. His voice sounded uncertain, but it was not cowardly intimidation. He was afraid, of course. There was no doubt about that. I noticed that he had straightened up somehow. I stopped in front of him and looked into his eyes. He was trying to concentrate, as if he were preparing for something important. Interrogating him in the usual way is unlikely to do any good, I decided. And I want information about Nameless, but the prisoner must give it himself, on his own inner impulse. It would be a kind of payment for his peace of mind. That's the only kind of confession we can talk about. At first glance, Schultz did not appear to be a man without feelings, and did not look decidedly like a thug. It was already clear to me on which side to approach him, not with the cold, insidious arrogance of a cruel victor, but as reason, heart and ethics told me. It is necessary to relieve Schultz of his fear. I urged myself to strengthen his moral strength and give a freer outlet to his feelings. I have always trusted more to the humanity of relationship, to benevolence, to an understanding of human distress, than to cruelty, which only strengthens the resistance of the humiliated against violence. Somewhere this fictitious boundary of passive obedience ends and stubbornness is born. Intelligence is gained in action and wisdom is gained with years lived. Schultz will probably experience more than one more nervous breakdown before his torment ends. Why not try to induce a crisis in him directly and weaken his resistance with constant pressure, using deep experiences? Schultz looked straight into my mouth, sweat beading on his forehead. You remember your wife and son, don't you? I asked in an insistent tone, indirectly touching on the subject he was afraid of. I motioned him to sit down. He looked even more pathetic now, pale and exhausted, and he eagerly reached for the offered cigarette. His fatigue contrasted sharply with the feverish alertness of his eyes. I shouted to Baylor and asked him to bring a spare Jim Nuskerton, to heat water, to prepare supper and boil tea, lots of tea. Baylor looked at the prisoner stroppily with ill-concealed dislike. Schultz turned his head in our direction and followed our conversation intently, though he understood nothing of it. Do you think that? Hitler will win the war? I suddenly asked him. He, after thinking, gave a negative answer. Already lying, I remarked to myself and... Don't say what you think will help you. Speak frankly. What do you think? We buried our faith in victory in Stalingrad. Still, he is up to his ears in Nazi ideology, I thought sadly. Do you believe in Hitler? I launched a direct attack. There many Germans believe in Hitler. After all, it doesn't matter who we follow. We're defending Germany, our homes, our families. We looked each other carefully in the eyes. Where were you during the Battle of Stalingrad? On the Don. Stalingrad is terrible. That's where all our misfortunes began. Seeing that the German was confused, I threw another accusation at him. 
I've never met a German who admits personal responsibility for everything the Nazis have done in the world. Silence reigned. Schultz bowed his head, covered his eyes, and then closed them with the palm of his hand, as if they could not bear even the flickering, meagre light of the paraffin lamp. For a few seconds, then he lowered his hand and stared stubbornly at the floor. In spite of their undoubted bravery, the Germans themselves are now showing poor service, I said in a quiet voice, playing with a burnt match. After a moment I remarked, as if unintentionally, that the enormous sacrifices of the German soldiers were a vain bloodshed, so a shameless crime in the fight for time, which for Hitler and the Wehrmacht was no longer working anyway. Time marches on with a calm, solemn step. I recited the first words of the refrain of a Nazi war song, and added in a firm voice as a warning, but only towards the final defeat of Hitler's Germany. I stood at the cooker and pondered, looking at the German. What is going on in his head? Why doesn't he speak? The hut was warm and cosy. I paced the room and talked as if to myself. I was saying that this war should have taught the Germans something, that now they should draw the right conclusions from their bitter experience, abandon once and for all the wars of conquest, and bury their hopes of inventing some unprecedentedly powerful weapon. There is no way for them to win a war now. Today you are surely losing the war, and tomorrow you will lose it completely. I finished my monologue and asked, Listen, Schultze, what good do you expect from this brown maniac who is leading the German people to disaster? The room became quiet again. Well, Kraut, now you have something to think about. I called out to Baylor. He put a large pot of tea and a bowl of supper on the cooker and took the prisoner into the kitchenette. When Schultz returned to the room, I could not help smiling. Hans Schultz, a noble Efri man of the Grenadier Regiment of the 75th Division, was clean washed, and he was wearing the Czechoslovak uniform of Private Girage Below. The gymnast jacket hung down on him, his long arms sticking out of the sleeves. The Ober Efrieta smiled too. Baylor, on the other hand, frowned. He was vigilant for the Germans' every sudden movement. Baylor placed the dinner and tea on the table, and Schultze, with a surprised expression on his face, barely waiting for the invitation, began to eat. He swallowed his food quickly and silently. And he raised the pot to his lips, but immediately lowered it, as if he wanted to say something, but instead he only looked at me. The atmosphere in the room made the German realise that it was not a question of life, but of his human dignity. It was obvious that he didn't feel threatened. That was exactly what I wanted, to win the German's trust so that his positive character traits could emerge, and that we must try to catch the right moment and bring the German to a voluntary confession. I looked him in the face and began to think how to behave with him further. Undoubtedly there would be disagreements between us during the discussion, and I should use this to smash his ideological, moral and philosophical dogmas. I must refute he all his arguments. Winning this battle may ultimately be tantamount to hoisting the Czechoslovak flag on the summit of Bezimianaya. Suddenly the silence of the night was broken by the rumble of explosions. The ground trembled, the glass in the windows rattled, the shells of the second salvo fell not far from our house. A heavy German battery was firing? Of course, the answer to the kidnapping, I joked. Schultz and I was listening to the echo of the fading explosions, but his face remained tense and motionless. Suddenly recalling a recent incident, I said, you brutally killed our soldier. And slowly, in a muffled voice, I added, we will punish you severely. I had no idea that these words would make the prisoner so confused. He stared at me as if petrified, with wide open eyes in which I read fear. I was not there, he said, unable to cope with his excitement. He almost dropped his cup. I have nothing in common with this cruelty. He said it as if it were the most important thing for him to convince me of that. For the atrocities committed, you are all responsible, uh, I said threateningly. He shrugged his shoulders indifferently. I decided to strike him again. Does membership in the Nazi party satisfy you? He blushed up to his ears, bent a little forward, and when he raised his head his face was very pale. For a moment he stared at the crucifix on the wall, and then, dropping his head on his palms, he suddenly shouted out, My God, what a Nazi I am! It was as if he wanted to protect himself from the consequences. Veins swelled on his temples. There was silence now when it was no longer possible to silence or correct anything. I could see that he was in real distress. It was the most opportune moment for my further offensive. I waited until he had calmed down a little, and then I went on the attack, sliding Schultz a military map of the battle area, 
I handed him a pencil and asked him carelessly, You seem to have mapped the battle situation in Bodruzel, don't you? He looked up at me in surprise, as if he did not understand the question. Gradually his eyes widened. He finally understood. Treason. To lose his military honour, he was afraid to think about it. These thoughts finally knocked him out of his rut. He had no sooner recovered from the first two blows than a third. Even more formidable one followed. I stared at him and kept silent. I understood without words. He was staring intensely at a single point on the wall, as if he were thinking hard about something. Some decision must have been ripening in him. He jerked towards me, as if seeking my help, and said in the voice of an unfortunate man in a desperate situation, No, I can't. It's a pity, I said with a sigh that was more a sign of compassion, and added, I understand your situation. I know the environment in which you were brought up. He was sitting by the cooker, where I had pushed a chair for him, holding a cup of hot tea in his hand. He was shaking with fever. Are you not afraid? No, he said, and shook his head. That was the worst of it. He did not appear to reject my proposal altogether, but neither did he have courage enough to choose between my offer and his sacred notion of the honour of the German soldier. So you wish then, without thinking, blindly submitting to the will of others, to continue to sow evil to the most deplorable end. I said the last words with emphasis. Allow me to, um, he objected with a serious look. Hmm, please speak. Do you think it is so easy to do? He asked quietly, as if he were in another world. Uh, it's not that difficult any more. Who and what did you swear an oath to? Think about it carefully. Suddenly he straightened up, and our gazes met. Uh, thank you very much. Strange, what's he thanking me for? Don't thank me. Unless I stopped and turned to him, you want to thank yourself for helping us. I recognized him now from a different side. If he was a Nazi, it was only formally. It did not escape me that there was a note of bitterness and hatred in his voice. However, it was not clear to whom this feeling of discontent was addressed, but it did not frighten me. I don't want to buy your soul for a bowl of lentils, I said in a conciliatory tone. Happiness is like a gift. It cannot be forced on anyone against their will. The prisoner's face remained sad and weary. You must find a new path in life, I encouraged him. You will not fight your conscience all the time, will you? He looked at me with a distracted look, clasping his hands between his knees, as if he were thinking about something. And at that moment Schiller's poems came to my mind. I had always loved his lyrical poems, but what I needed most now was his optimism. So I tried it. Ah, how harsh is the time between great intentions and their fulfilment. How many vain worries, how much indecision. It is about life, it is about much more than that. About honour. The prisoner recognised the author at once, and became animated. No. Tell me, I asked after a short pause, what is the measure of human dignity in Germany today? You know, dazedly silent, and I continue. You know it. You have learnt it. You too consider it a moral necessity that the German people die fighting for this regime of yours. In complete silence, I continued in an agitated voice. Whoever has realized the criminal aims of the Nazis is morally obliged to fight them. Silence continued to hang in the room. How can you, an educated and religious man, serve such a filthy cause? When he did not know what to answer to this question, I added sympathetically. I pity you. Master and such an empty life. Is it possible to live like this? He looked away, and I continued to build up the offensive. When your father creates his saviour, he puts his impulses, his feelings, people's aspirations into the processed material. Behind his work he is himself a, a living man, his very humanity, his inner truth, with which he conquers the world and sanctifies it with beauty. He creates a world that laughs, a world of love and forgiveness. Hitler is a world in tears. What did you swear an oath to? To obediently kill, rob, rape all those who lived in peace with you. You reduced half of Europe to rubble. You caused immeasurable misery to many nations. You swore an oath to this dirty policy and no other. The prisoner put his hands around his head, as if trying not to hear my words. I was no longer retreat. Whoever remains loyal to Hitler's criminal regime will become an accessory to the crime. Today you can behave freely. So come on. He took a deep breath. I waited for him to answer, but when I realized that he had not made a final decision, I leaned closer to him and asked him quietly, 
Wouldn't it have been better for you to die? Why? He asked in surprise, and it was the first word he said after a long silence. Do you want to continue to torment your conscience? I went up to him and took him by the elbow. You have no reason to die, and if you die in this war, it will be for the crappiest cause. After these words, Schultzer raised himself up and looked me in the eye. It seemed that he had nothing more to say, but he slowly squeezed out of himself. My conscience is clear. Do you think so? Emphasizing every word, I continued. In a losing war, there come moments when everyone has to decide. You are a prisoner. The outcome of the war is certain. Nothing is more certain. Think of the future. He was frightened by my tone and obviously realized that it was finer time for him to make up his mind. He had forgotten about the tea cooling on the table. He was clutching his temple with his hand, his lips twitching nervously. That something was happening to him. I kept my eyes on him. I had the impression that he was hesitating and that my words had not gone unnoticed. I stepped away from him, then turned round and said in a calm turn, Wisdom, Master Teacher, lies in making the necessary decision in time. I could see that my talking to him had brought him relief. It was written on his face, so I did not lose hope. Before I closed the door behind me, I heard him sigh desperately. I left him alone with himself. I stood outside the cabin and heard the prisoner pacing back and forth across the room, speeding up and slowing down. Everything told me that he was struggling internally. Hmm, so is it decided? I asked the prisoner cheerfully when I entered the room half an hour later. My nerves were frayed with feverish anticipation. I couldn't wait to hear the German answer all my questions. How many times had I already asked myself how the Germans were being held on the heights? For days our artillery had been firing concentrated fire. It seemed impossible that on the height, constantly illuminated by whirlwinds of fire, there was anything alive, but it was not. When our fighters again and again attacked the seemingly extinct mountain, the enemy met them with dense fire and given that the forest in the direction of the attack was mostly destroyed, we had to fight with the enemy more and more often in close combat. We were ashamed. The lists of killed and wounded were growing, and I could not find the reason for our failures, but now at last we will take them by the gills. Find out how they manoeuvre, where they have reserves, where machine gun nests are, where they pull together for the night. And then tomorrow probably the massacre at Bezimaniah will end. Schultz had sat in front of the map and scratched something on it. Then he began to tell me about the defences on the heights. He spoke in a strained voice and generally behaved a little strangely. I watched him closely. One glance was enough for me to realise that the prisoner had switched to another string. I was almost certain that he was deceiving me. However, more convincing evidence was needed, and so I did not rush to a final decision. Was this really the same man to whom I had spoken with such confidence only an hour ago? I listened to him, leaning over the map, and asked him a few questions. He did not answer them very convincingly. He certainly knew what he was talking about, however, how credible was his information. My distrust and suspicion were growing. Suddenly it hit me. Think of your wife and son, I repeated insistently, several times. Act as if your child were in mortal danger and you were protecting him. I scrutinized the map and then looked at Schultz intently. He immediately averted his gaze. There could be no doubt he was deceiving me. My suspicion turned into certainty. Such meanness and such hypocrisy. I was being fooled and deceived. I struck the table with anger. A little more and words would have come out of my tongue that would have destroyed everything. All this providentially created delicate system, but I pulled myself together. Yes, you've done rather foolishly, I said in a tragic voice. You will be shot. Hmm, for God's sake. He looked at me pleadingly. I looked at him and waited to see if he would fall to the floor. I realized from the German's face that he wanted to say something. He stood up and hastily began to say that he did not want to betray his friends in the machine gun nests. So he had marked their fighting positions incorrectly, and some of them not at all, in order to save his friends from destruction. You've been imprudent. We don't have much time. I was angry. The whole well-thought-out concept of interrogation was falling apart. But I remembered my promise to myself to keep my temper and try to understand the prisoner. After all, the goal is important to me. However, everything indicates that this German is not yet an immoral and amoral type. No, he's certainly not an orthodox Nazi. Absolutely not. But I must finish him up. Having collected my thoughts, I began... The ideological roots of evil lie in your upbringing, in the pernicious philosophy of the superiority of the German race. 
For many years you have been the object of this philosophy. How many erroneous theories the German people had. For example, Hegel said that only a German can love his people and his homeland, and you all recognize nationalism. And Fitchie. He proclaimed that only the German people were responsible for saving human culture. I paused to calm down and continued. Teacher, I'm going to read you something now. Fate must be honored. Fate says to the weak, Z. I cast a glance at him and continued reading. The moral man represents not an improved man, but a weakened man. Should Schultze listen tensely, but he was clearly not enjoying it. I, however, went on inexorably. A dominant race can only grow from formidable and violent sources. A displeased expression appeared on the prisoner's face, indicating his disagreement. First of all, I it, I had struck him again. First of all, consciousness must be overcome, for consciousness is a perversion inculcated by Christianity and democracy. Everything that prevents man from exercising his natural oppressive and exploitative instincts must be eliminated. Giotzi summoned all his strength to swallow what he heard. Modest, diligent, virtuous, discreet. Is this what you would like man to be? But this is the perfect slave, the slave of the future. Giotzi dropped his head on his hands, resting his elbows on the table, and closed his eyes. I continue. The atrocities are no longer horrifying. The barbarian and the savage beast live in each of us. I put the notebook aside in disgust. Nietzsche came out of his mouth. The prisoner stood up. Yes, Nietzsche, I confirmed. He looked at my face in amazement and then slowly, very slowly, said a single word. No, terrible. No, Schultz's resistance was not simulated. Lieutenant Siegfried Perschke did not die in vain. He died in time in September 1944, leaving behind an elegant notebook with quotations from Nietzsche's philosophical treatises. This document must have guided his practice. That's how you all are, I said sternly. You don't believe me. I took out of my pocket some photographs taken from German prisoners and threw them to Schultz on the table. Here is your philosophy in practice. It was noticeable that he was shocked. Long live the German Superman and his Nazi culture. I said, as if in passing, as I looked through the pictures. And all this is done in the name of the German people, who you serve under a Nazi oath. Nazism does not mean the German people. No. Tell me then, where exactly are the German people? Everywhere. The German people is Germany itself. What about the SS, the Gestapo? Is that Germany too? No, no. We Germans do not agree with Nazism, with what it does. Schultze said hastily and straightened up. But, 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 and what resistance do you offer to it? What have you, Schultz, done for his downfall? He has been tormented, very tormented. Dissent alone is not enough, not enough. Master, it's shamefully little. Couldn't anything have been done? Nothing at all. Well, of course not. There's nothing to be done if fear is stronger than duty, stronger than faith and honor. You don't know that with his repression. He who doesn't know all this won't understand. Hmm. So your knees are still shaking in captivity. After these words there was silence. The prisoner's strength was probably exhausted. Schultz finally made up his mind. Suddenly everything became simple and clear to him. Moo, no, please the map, he said with sudden vigor. And when he said it he seemed relieved. His fear was gone. His eyes lit up with sincerity. He raised his head and firmly declared that he no longer felt bound by the oath. As I looked into his face, I could now tell with certainty that he was thinking in a sensible and serious way. It was now the second hour of the night. The German began to speak. In deep silence, he spoke briefly of his fate. Never had the truth meant so much to him as at this hour, and then a just anger flared up in him. I listened to him attentively. It was straightforward, frank manly talk. When Bela quietly opened the door after a while, I saw us bent over a map and talking sweetly. Schultz was tracing the map with a pencil and carefully explaining it to me. I listened attentively and sighed with relief from time to time. Of excitement I could not even sit and almost every minute I jumped up, walked around the room, went to the window. I inwardly exulted from success and satisfied, smiled into the darkness. Hmm, that's sincere and honest. I said and gave Schultz a friendly pat on the shoulder. Schultz was on the verge of exhaustion. His eyelids drooped helplessly. He leaned tiredly against the table and rested his head on his folded hands. That same morning all preparations were made for a new pattern of fire. 
so that the next attack would be the last in this long, long battle for the exits of the Carpathians. And this attack was carried out. On 18 November 1944, south of Nizhny Komarnik, the Soviet units penetrated the extreme Pole Gorge, dominated by the heavily fortified Obshar Mountains on one side and Hill 541 on the other. Our 2nd and 3rd Battalions fought their way up to the saddle between Obshar and the Bezimyanaya Heights to the east. The next day, both battalions together with the Soviet units after heavy fighting took the key position of Obshar, advanced to the road leading from Krajina Poljana to Bodrozale, and in the afternoon the soldiers of Svoboda were already standing on the summit of Bezimyanaya. However, the enemy, having lost Obshar, began to fight for the height. Relying on the surviving positions, he rushed into a furious counterattack. He pushed the Bikosnovak fighters from the top of Bezimyanaya and again penetrated Obshar, threatening the right wing of the corps and the left flank of the Soviet 305th Division with his advance. The thinned and tired 2nd and 3rd Battalions were unable to resist the actions of the enemy, who tried to encircle them. The remaining forces were consolidated during the battle into one battalion, commanded by Staff Captain Frantisek Zedlik. During the night battle, his command centre became surrounded. A fierce battle broke out. The Nazis wanted to capture the command post at any cost, but fortunately in the darkness the enemy did not notice one single unbroken telephone line. So Sedlakek was able to ask for help from the commander of the second company, Captain Kuzhal, and report to the corps commander about the desperate situation of his unit on Bezimaniana. Kuzel arrived with reinforcements to the battle site within an hour, and very opportunely, as the battalion commander's position was critical. There was a threat that the units would again be thrown back to the pass. General Saboda, in order to save the situation, decided to throw all available forces into the battle and ordered to quickly organize a special strike group under the command of Captain Kunzel from the Operations Department of the Corps' headquarters. Streep he attached to the battalion commander and set the task. To capture Bezimianaya and hold it. No, Sasek, you must hold it at all costs. I'm sending you reinforcements. Staff Captain Sedlakek heard the energetic voice of the Corps' commander Ludwig Swoboda. At night, Kunzel's group left Barwinik for Lower Komarnik and early in the morning of 19 November, entered the battle for Bezimian Naya. Until 23 November, the heavy fighting for the height was fruitless. Even a powerful concentration of fire could not suppress the enemy's resistance and prevent him from launching constant counterattacks. The enemy wanted to hold Bezimaya at all costs. The height was occupied by Zicha Slovak units only in the afternoon of 24 November. This decided the fate of the German defence at the exit from the Carpathians in the entire Duklinski direction. 23 November was the last day for many. Lieutenant Jurek, Lieutenant Neusless and other brave soldiers fell on that day. The day dragged on indefinitely. At last evening came, and twilight descended on the mountains. The trees, mangled by bullets and shells, were drowned in fog. The last leaves fell tiredly to the ground. It seemed that even nature itself was preparing for something serious. The fateful tomorrow, the 24th of November, was approaching. That day would decide for whom the bells would toll. Say in the last night, everything comes last. In war, that last comes quicker. In battle, death overtakes time. For many days, Kakoslovak soldiers fought for Bezimianaya. In the evening after the battle, completely exhausted, they fell off their feet anywhere. Somewhere in a lull, somewhere in a shell crater, somewhere between fallen trees. Two or three soldiers spread soft pine needles and huddled together, tried to fall asleep quick, and so with machine guns in their hands they spent the frosty night. Which one was it? What, after all, in the life of a soldier does this one night mean? Only one night is followed by another just as nasty and full of uncertainty. The darkness of the night blurred the pale background of the snow-covered terrain, and the trees disappeared from sight. Silence reigned. Everyone fell asleep, but someone from the sleepers would cry out, and at once the soldiers pressed closer to each other. Someone's hand went up, someone burrowed deeper into his overcoat. A quiet sigh came from somewhere. A cigarette was lit, a thin face flashed in the red glow. The ruby light was in one place for a minute, then flew a few meters and burned out in the snow. Someone was awake. Suddenly the silence of the night was broken by gunfire. The shots rang out like thunder. The obsha rumbled menacingly, echoed by the prikra, and the jaruha echoed deafeningly. It echoed throughout the valley. 
The men clutched their weapons, listened to the firing for a minute, and then, displeased at being awakened, went back to sleep. It must be on Yaruka, said the soldiers in their sleep. On the wooded Jerusha, the forward patrols faced the enemy from night to night. Lieutenant Jan Palmer was standing that night in an extended trench, looking towards the German fortifications. Suddenly he became alert. Among the night stains and muddy streaks he noticed something that had not been there before. Palmer, not thinking long, pressed the trigger of the automatic rifle and made a long cue, and then regretted it. Why was it necessary to shoot at once? Maybe they were crawling to surrender. But, on the other hand, who goes to surrender like that? No, he was absolutely right to kill the Hitlites, so that night shooting didn't come from Yeruka. There was silence again. Nothing was heard in the forest. Captain Kunzel in these days of incessant fighting rested very little. For the second time tonight he went round the location of the strike group from trench to trench, from soldier to soldier. The night was alarmingly quiet. How much did this cursed mountain cost them blood? The fighting for it began on the 19th of November and was going on daily, and on Bezimanya was still heard foreign speech. Yesterday morning at this time there was already a battle going on. Brutal, merciless. They managed to approach the enemy's defensive positions up to a hundred meters, but then they were driven back by a counterattack. Three times during the day they fired upwards, and three times they were shot in the back. The swelling eyelids were drooping. The captain decided to go for a short nap in Sedlaxic's dugout. Out of the misty dawn the vague outlines of trees and tall stumps began to show. The commander's dugout in the saddle below Bezimayanaya protruded darkly from the thinning morning twilight. Here and there cigarette smoke was rising, and soon the whole nearby space was filled with its irritating odour. Those who were already awake were immediately drawn in by the odour. One soldier coughed, then another, and in a minute the whole forest was coughing. Coughing fits tormented people more and more. Voices sounded hoarse in their sleep, and the rustling of branches could be heard. People crawled out of their night holes, stomped their feet shakily and beat their hands together. Soaked faces looked eagerly towards the rear. The clinking of metal utensils was heard. There was the smell of hot food. In an instant, the forest became noisy. In the gloom of the forest, everyone hurried for hot food left from last night and for tea and vodka for today. The fighters pulled the camp kitchen on their backs up the steep slopes of Obshar, and it was not always without losses. It was about six o'clock in the morning. In the morning overcast twilight, filled with a drifting mist, one could smell the odours of smouldering wood and resin from the broken spruce trees. They were brought here by a light breeze, so gentle that it was hard to feel it on the skin. There were other odours in the air too. There was the smell of something sweet, and a moment later it was the smell of burnt wood. All the odours blended into one indefinable odour. All of these were the very things that made Mount Nameless. Without these odours it would have been just a mountain, one of many in the endless sea of Carpathian peaks, about which no one would have spoken or written. On the cloudy morning of 24 November, we were finishing preparations for an artillery attack on the last Carpathian bastion in the offensive line of the Czechoslovak Army Corps. Now, thanks to the testimony of prisoner Schultz, we finally knew the location of the enemy's firing points and his fire and reserve manoeuvres on Bezimian Naya and could fire at specific targets. General Svoboda scheduled the final attack for 14 hours and 5 minutes. To let the men rest and make diligent preparations, he ordered. The Corps Commander's Command post was on a slope a little below the saddle between Obshar and Bezimanaya. In the entire space around the saddle, there were only a few spruce and beech trees with their branches cut off. All other trees were either stumps or burnt trunks sticking up into the sky. All that was left of the forest was mangled by shell fragments and mines. In accordance with the experience of 18 November, the soldiers cleared the space in front of the trenches from the branches to the distance of a grenade throw. The corps commander and Captain Kunzel came out of the dugout and looked around. Apart from the sentries, who had also camouflaged their positions, they saw no one. But there were about two hundred soldiers here. On this chilly, damp morning, Sedlek's small figure seemed even smaller. His unshaven face looked tired, but his eyes burned with unyielding determination. The constant strain of the three-month battle and the rigours of fighting in the Carpathians in winter conditions, without replacement or rest, had worn the men down both physically and mentally. The fighters, mainly infantrymen, were completely exhausted. Since October the Czechoslovak units had been fighting continuously, 
and before they reached the border heights of Duclip, they had to overcome a thorny path with battles for the northern approaches to the Duclip Pass since 8 September. For a long time, the troops were exposed to heavy enemy artillery fire, suffered from cold, malnutrition, and lack of sleep. In a difficult moment, a soldier wants to hear his commander. And that day, 24 November 1944, it was really hard for the infantry at Bezimanaya. Sedler Cake and Kunzal always had time for their men both at rest and in battle. And in those critical minutes before the last attack, they too spoke to the soldiers. They spoke military tough, without vituperation, as if face to face. None of the commanders tried to embellish the existing situi. A soldier can be deceived only for a minute. No, guys, Mum, Captain Kunzel began roughly like this. For a whole week now we've been fighting the Krauts for this damned height. We've been throwing ourselves into attacks and the Krauts have collapsed on the mountain and are laughing all round. They're laughing at us on our mountain. But we'll take it after all. Aren't you ashamed? The way to our homes is only through this peak and no other way. Have you stopped believing in yourselves? You're drawn to the valley, to the roof over your head, to home, and only here is the shortest way home. Captain Kunzo wanted to look into the eyes of his subordinates, but he could not. The soldiers were shuffling from foot to foot. Many of them were looking at the ground. Then battalion commander said Lakak addressed them. He, too, began without introduction. I remember better times when the Krauts were fleeing from you. You chased them from the Polish land through Dukla to these mountains, and then suddenly, TPR. Why do you hang your heads and tremble in front of their positions? Do you really want someone else to take Bezimir Naya and not you? We've been here a long time, and no one knows the enemy better than we do. General Svoboda called me. He said that we must take Bezimir Naya and open the gates to Czechoslovakia. At 2.5 p.m., we'll go on the offensive. In this area, for the last time, our intelligence has done a lot of work, and now we know about the Nazis what we did not know before. We know where they have weapons and mortars. We know their manoeuvres and resting places. Our gunners will go with us in this last attack. It would be unforgivable if we let ourselves be thrown down. The general trusts us and will be watching our actions. The battalion commander fell silent. The frowning faces of the soldiers began to lighten. The gloomy atmosphere dissipated. Confidence in their own abilities returned. Sedlikek and Kunzel returned to the command post with the feeling that today they would get their way. At the command post, Kunzel raked up the fire and tossed dry twigs. About twelve o'clock, I heard Svoboda's voice on the tube. And they say, sir, you have to take the high ground. Do you hear? Take it. From the observation point on Kamanika Hill, I had another short conversation with Captain Kunzel, trust the artillery. I told him, adapt to our fire. It will be accurate, as accurate as possible. It was 13 hours and 45 minutes. Nothing said that in a few minutes a terrible battle would begin here. The strike grouping of Sekoslovak units was placed on both sides of the ridge from Obshar to Bezimayanaya, with the direction of the main blow along the ridge. Seven strike groups from the remnants of the 2nd, 3rd and 5th battalions were commanded by experienced soldiers. Lieutenants Groda, Balanda, Matyatko, Palmer, Pospisil, Gunda and Staff Sergeant Jones. At 14.5, everyone pulled their heads in. The air whistled above the saddle. There was noise and whistling of all kinds. It seemed that shells and mines were competing with each other for the primacy of landing. Some shells whizzed so low over the ridge that the soldiers lying there buried their noses in the snow in fear. The shock wave leaped upwards. Everyone felt the air come into motion. The first destructive blow of the Czechoslovak batteries and the Soviet batteries attached to reinforce them was intended for the enemy's reserves. So to speak, mobile targets and mortar and artillery batteries, because they always inflicted heavy losses on the infantrymen. After the battle, it was discovered that the enemy's mortar batteries in fighting positions in the valley and at the Bodrusel motorway had been completely destroyed by the artillery preparation. Then a tornado of fire swept over the top of the mountain and the front edge of the German defences. Yellowish flames of bursts soared above the ground, the explosions merged into a continuous rumble, the sound waves collided and diverged. Now the fire was directed at the enemy's forward defence, Echelon. The last minutes before the attack were running out. Then the direction of fire was shifted upwards. Taking advantage of the chaos created, the infantrymen, following the sappers, ducked down and attacked the front German positions. After a moment's confusion, the surviving fascists opened furious shooting. 
our fighters began to throw grenades, and again a long series of explosions shook the ground, and again the ground trembled under the feet of the attackers. Strike groups were rising and through the fog, and rain went forward. On the right wing of the grouping, on the southern slopes of the heights facing Bodrogoshal, automatic rifles and heavy machine guns rang out frantically. Here Lieutenant Gunda's group engaged in a fierce battle. Palmer's group, after a swift attack, a sharp wedge, crashed into the German defence. The enemy increased resistance. Lieutenant Gunda Cooley led the battle. After waiting a moment, he shouted hurrah and, firing on the move, rushed forward. His soldiers followed him. They fell down, got up again, and fired all the time. A melee ensued. Explosions were heard on the left, the screams of the wounded. Because of the noise, we could not hear what they were shouting. It turned out that the attackers had hit a minefield. Several soldiers, writhing in pain, rolled on the ground. Rude's group was making its way on the main line to the rear of the machine gun nest. Sub-Lieutenant Gruder, as he approached the pillbox, saw fire burst from the barrel. As if thrown by a spring, he rushed to the embrasure and threw a grenade right into it. The machine gun immediately fell silent. The shock group, led by Jiri Gruder, with loud shouts of horror, rushed forward to the top of the mountain. At that moment, a deafening explosion was heard in the thick of the strike group, and Lieutenant Groder fell to the ground. The fight continued. Suddenly, there was a terrible roar. Yes, it was a real roar, as hundreds of people were screaming furiously. It sent shivers down my spine. Pospizil and Balander's men rushed to the attack again. At this time, Matyako went round the mountain on the left, from where he heard the clatter of machine gun fire. At this point, a fierce battle broke out again. German machine guns were fiercely slashing, the explosions of shells were rumbling. The Germans tried to counterattack, but they could not do anything serious. Stunned by our artillery preparation, they lost the strength for an organized strike. Moving through the liberated area, our fighters saw a terrible picture, all that was left of the enemy after the artillery cannonade. The fight lasted for an hour. One of our fighters rushed after a fleeing Hitlerite. The Germans suddenly disappeared. The soldier looked around and then cautiously approached the piled beach on the slope. He peered over the ledge and saw the German's face. Both froze at the unexpected encounter. The machine guns lowered. The Nazis' eyes fixed on the Kosovak. Fear and hatred froze in those eyes. The German's hand moved, but he was a fraction of a second too late and a moment later collapsed on the barrel. His body snapped in half, his arms hung lifelessly, his hair fell over his face. A martial horror filled the forest all along the front. Everyone rushed towards the top of the mountain. It was a relentless battle. The oppressive hopelessness of failure, the suffering endured, the pain of loss, all this somehow at once intertwined and called for retribution. The attack was fierce. Survivors Hitlerites flashed between the trees, trying to get away from the pursuers. Strike groups were already making their way to the top. Palmer was the first to jump into the main trench, threw a grenade into the bunker, gave a line at the fat field officer who was leading reinforcements. Palmer's fighters were already on high ground, but they still had to overcome a small patch of open ground. However, as soon as they jumped out onto it, a light German machine gun started to work. Though an then they heard firing on the other side of the peak in the direction of Bodruzal. They were short, disciplined cues. After a while, there sounded a mighty hurrah. A minute later, this attacking cry was heard to the left of Prikri. From everywhere, the soldiers of Setluk's battalion were marching to the last attack. At the summit they made, when after a hard battle, another piece of native land was snatched from the hated enemy. The hearts of the soldiers were filled with joy and satisfaction from the battle success. The neighborhood was shrouded in fog. From the overcast sky, snowflakes occasionally fell. And good soldiers can sometimes be shaken. But the main thing, in time to correct the situation, I was then directing the actions of the artillery, and being at the observation point, was not a direct witness to the dramatic events at Bezimanyania. Gepra Lieutenant Frantisek said Lassik, recalled after the war how he commanded a mixed battalion during the last attack on Bezimanyania. Here is what he told me about the last minutes of the attack. With Polder Kunzel, I marched right behind the chain in the middle of the group. After an effective artillery preparation, ours rushed into the attack. The attack was so bold and unexpected for the enemy that our infantry penetrated with relative ease almost to the very top of the heights, before machine guns began to fire from the remaining pillboxes behind. We got wounded and killed. Polder's arm was shot through. The wound was bleeding badly, but he did not leave the battlefield. 
Using the commander's authority, I ordered him to do so. Jerry Grude was leading a strike group, which was made up of specially selected soldiers with the task of eliminating enemy pillboxes that had not been destroyed by artillery. When Grudo was wounded, I ordered him to be taken to the infirmary. He was badly wounded. During the attack, Jerry stepped on one of the anti-personnel mines. Another one exploded under him when he fell. That's how Jerry Groda died. I lost one of the most courageous and active commanders of the battalion. With his inexhaustible energy and militancy, he repeatedly lifted the men of the battalion to the attack. When he was carried away on a cloak tent, his look was full of confidence and calmness. I told him that he was one of the best fighters in the battle for Bezimir Naya, and that now we would never give it up. Immediately after the capture of the height, I gathered the soldiers who were in the neighborhood, and with their consent I named the height after the hero who had just fallen. Nameless became Grove Mountain. We saluted the dead. I suggested that our cartographers inscribe the name of the glorious mountain on the maps in memory of those who laid down their heads here. Captain Polder Kunzel also played a very big role in the battle for Bezimianaya. Fearless, self-sacrificing, he knew how to lift men up, and it may be considered a miracle that he got out of that scorcher with only a shot through his arm. I never saw him sleep. He was an invaluable assistant to me, and I could hardly have done without him in the most difficult moments of the battle. Thanks to the artillerymen, we took the heights relatively quickly and suffered few casualties. With accurate fire, the artillerymen smashed the enemy's fortifications and trenches, blocked the reserve's approaches to the battlefield, but most of all they helped in suppressing mortar batteries and guns. Your artillerymen supported the offensive well. True, at one time, when the blow was struck on the front line of defence, the shells fell quite close to us. By radio we corrected their fire, and my men after the signal to transfer the firing went into the attack. This is what General said Lasik remembered. Captain Kunzel also told me about the circumstances of the heroic death of Lieutenant Grodra. During the battle I shouted to Sedkek and Balanda and fired a green rocket. There are thunderous booms all round. Rocks are flying up in front of us, shells are tearing the crowns of trees, already almost completely ragged. The swamp is smoking. I fire a red rocket and shout, Go! There is no need to fire the green rocket for the chief of the corps' artillery. Seeing our thinning chains has moved the fire of the guns forward, and now they strike with the regularity of a great sledgehammer. I cannot say how many times this heavy hammer fell on the Nazis, and whether the hole in my overcoat was the result of enemy fire or ours. Yes, there was a danger of hitting our own men, but the enemy in front of us was strong, and therefore it was necessary to give him blow after blow to ensure the success of our attack. To the fascist trenches, a short distance, for useless for Jurek, for all our guys. Forward. I shout, I call, and I don't know if anyone hears me, but I see the main thing. They are running after me. We are beating the fascists. During the last attack, when it became clear that victory was in our hands, I met soldiers who were carrying Groda. He stepped on a mine. Groda, on a tent, blue, covered to the waist. With difficulty, he squeezed out of himself. Mr. Captain to drink. In the evening, on the eve of this offensive, the corps commander sent us cigarettes and two bottles of cognac. We left them to celebrate the capture of Bezi Manaya. I handed Grood a bottle, but I didn't have the heart to say to your health. Cook of Eyes took a few sips and whispered. Goodbye, and he didn't finish. Grouder was the best officer in the strike group. Even after so many exhausting attacks, counterattacks, and retreats, he was still energetic and strong willed. Mount Bezimanaya should rightfully bear his name. Lieutenant Neuschluss died on 23 November, continued his story Kunzel. Hitlerites made a brutal massacre over him. We found him after the last, fourth attack. The Nazis stripped him of all his clothes, Neuschluss in the heat of battle too far forward, and when he noticed that he was alone it was too late. Nadparich Hikjurik arrived at the front, near Bezimanaya, on 20 November, and three days later he died. In case of my death, send my wife documents and a photograph. Yeah, on the eve of the battle, said Yurik. In the summer of 1965, I visited the area of the Dukla battles. I wanted to remember my fellow soldiers, those who survived and those who died. I was drawn to Opsar and Hradova Hora. On the way from Prague to Svidnik, I thought over the plan of the trip and the mines. It suddenly occurred to me, after all, even after 21 years, there may still be mines there, 
Olob, Shara, and Bezimayanaya, they were only anti-personnel mines. Wooden ones, so they rotted long ago. I reassured myself. However, the chairman of the National Committee in Lower Kamarnik assured me otherwise, saying that in remote places there were still accidents caused by old mines exploding. So the detonators in rotted mine boxes are still dangerous to this day. None of the locals dared to accompany me to the remote area of Grood Mountain. So I went alone. Cautiously, as if on pins and needles, I climbed up the mountainside from the Komanitsa side. But what was the use of caution when I could step on a rotted box with a fuse at any moment? Besides, if anything happened, what would I do alone? I trudged upwards through the green jungle. Almost at the very top I saw two human skulls. One of them had been penetrated, probably by shrapnel. There were bones scattered around. It was all that was left of those who had died here in the fighting. There were also unexploded mines of 52 MA calibre machine gun tapes and other weapons. Probably no man had set foot here since the end of the war, even though the village was situated on the very slope. The trees, once broken and uprooted, had already rotted away and were replaced by almost impenetrable thickets of a new generation of trees. Out of compassion for the fallen and respect for the living, as an instruction to those who will come after us, I wrote this non-fictional story about the last attack that ended the Carpathian Duklinskaya operation. This is how one of many combat episodes ended, when the success of a battalion, brigade or course depended on the heroism of individual soldiers or small groups. Death of a hero. The sky frowned, a small snowball started to fall. Lieutenant Palmer quickly ran down the slope of a wooded hill and, stopping at the edge of the forest, carefully surveyed the terrain, as was his habit. A few trees grew directly in front of him, and farther on he could see a bare field of snow. At the place where the officer was standing the slope was not steep, but a little lower it turned into a precipice, beyond which there was a dark strip of coniferous forest. To the right and left rose forested heights, and beyond them, through the snow-covered gloom of the November morning, the vague outline of a low mountain range. Palmer scrutinised the terrain in detail, listening intensely to the occasional shots coming from down the valley from Mirolia, but he saw neither his soldiers nor the enemy. You can't catch up with them now, thought Palmer, as he went down to a tree at the edge of the edge of the forest. He was tall and stately, his face wet with sweat, his chest heaving with heavy breathing. Palmer put the machine gun against the trunk of the tree, took off his pistol and belt, and undid the buttons of his overcoat and tunic, then turned his face towards the west. At this moment he was not thinking of anything definite. The excitement of the recent battle had not yet subsided in his soul. However, the acrid, sweet-smelling odour that enveloped the heights was still a reminder of the drama that had been played out here, fascinated by the new distances that opened before him after the capture of the heights. Palmer breathed deeply, with pleasure the fresh air from the wooded hills, and only now he realised that the height was silent. Stubbornly silent. It suddenly seemed so unnatural and incomprehensible that he had a disturbing sense of the unreality of everything that was happening. The snowfall intensified. Snowflakes were sticking to his eyebrows, covering his hair and the coarse fabric of his overcoat. Islets of browned needles and fallen leaves became whiter and whiter. Suddenly he remembered the joy and excitement with which he had always waited in his childhood for the onset of winter and the first snow. Then he used to feel a certain carelessness, and as a carefree boy he used to have a lot of fun. And now he felt good and pleasant, as in those distant years when he had seen the first drifts of freshly fallen snow outside his window at dawn. Palmer looked calmly at the falling snowflakes. He was generally in good spirits, and for good reason. The bloody fighting for the last fascist stronghold on the Duklinski Pass exit was over, and he was alive and well. However, he was lucky in this. In four penetrations in his overcoat and an insignificant scratch from a grenade splinter, these were all the traces of the recent fight with the enemy. Throughout all these battles he had been remarkably confident in his strengths, and today he fought with unprecedented rage and frenzy. His memory now, and then arose pictures of the subsided battle. Especially memorable was the moment when they broke through to the Nazi resistance node on Mount Bezimayanaya, and he jumped into the main German trench. He had experienced such climactic moments of battle before, when his throat dries up and fear fades away. But never before had he felt such intense excitement as in the battle for this height. Never before had he realised with such certainty his moral superiority over the enemy. Usually after the battle he was apathetic, 
but this time he was overwhelmed with a feeling of complete happiness. He felt like a fighter for a just cause who had successfully completed the task at hand. For a moment his face frowned. He remembered how in the midst of the battle he had shouted, Here's for Wenzel, for Pospisil, for Kuzma, for everyone. When the height was taken, Palmer looked round and was horrified. Here and there were dead men lying dead, and wounded men of his unit writhing in pain. All of them were cheerful and brave guys. All of them dreamed of returning home. Many of them would never get up again. The sub-lieutenant thoughtfully looked back to where the Nazi defence line had recently been. He stood at the edge of the forest, immersed in memories. The unusual silence and the feeling of safety gradually calmed his agitated nerves. He was terribly thirsty. Palmer went down the slope to a clearing bent down and, scooping up fresh snow with the palm of his hand, brought it to his mouth. Then he turned and walked slowly towards the tree where his weapon had been left. Suddenly the thought struck him that he had been too long at this altitude, for he had nothing more to do here. The task set by the captain he had fulfilled. He must return to his unit. He remembered the captain's warnings that there were individual soldiers and groups of defeated fascist units roaming around and attacking our fighters. From the distant echoes of battle, Palmer realized that our units were advancing rapidly. He was suddenly seized with annoyance. He is stuck here doing nothing, and his boys are now fighting with the Germans. He had always been together with his soldiers. Among them, he felt easy and familiar. But now he was separated from them for a while by this unfortunate task. And it had to happen just when, after a long and agonizing wait, they were rapidly marching forward on their native land. This temporary detachment from their own echoed in him a sharp pan. He suddenly felt lonely, abandoned in something guilty. It is true what they say. A man cannot stand loneliness. Life without people is unbearable, and in this cruel time it is sometimes so difficult for a man that he cannot bear loneliness. Man must connect his life with the fate of others and dedicate himself to a high purpose, one that concerns all people. A man must know what he lives for and what he dies for. Only then he is able to endure all the trials and dying, not to remain alone. For some reason all these thoughts for the first time came to Palmer's mind just now. Apparently because now he had no friends with him and he was tormented by the feeling of loneliness. But I was on a mission, Palmer said to himself as if justifying himself. I inspected the battlefield as ordered, provided aid to the wounded, cared for the dead. And now I will go down to the valley, catch some car from the rear of the corpse and quickly catch up with their own. Nevertheless, strangely enough, he did not feel like leaving. Before, these damned mountains were literally in his liver. When the last offensive had begun, he had only wished that it would all be over quickly, that the unfortunate height would be far behind him. And now, when at last he could leave it, it was pulling at him like a magnet, preventing him from going any further. Again and again the images of his dead battle buddies came before his eyes, and he could not resist it. Leaning back against a tree, Palmer looked at the slope of the height, covered with a sparse forest, and continued to remember the battle that had raged. Somewhere up there were German trenches, and this place where he was standing now was already in the rear. He thought with a shudder of what awaited him if the Nazis captured him here. Slowly the snow was falling on the dusky forest. Awakened from his memories, Palmer once again felt a sense of peace and nonchalance. For the first time during the fighting, snow is falling quietly on this piece of Slovak land, he thought. The sudden peaceful silence stirred his soul. His whole being felt the joy of being, longed for physical and spiritual release. Pictures of the distant past surfaced in his memory. His family came to mind and his eyes clouded with longing and joyful anticipation. This year son Yakub turned ten years old already, he noted with surprise. Palmer pulled his wallet out of his tunic pocket, rummaged through it with stiff fingers, and pulled out a scuffed photo of his wife and son. What had they become over the years? Jacob had blonde curly hair and cheerful dark eyes. He laughed with a ringing and mischievous laugh. And Maria was a beautiful woman, a loving wife. Palmer remembered how he had parted with his son and his throat went into spasm. It would be necessary to come here with them, to show the places where he had fought, where he remembered them. A mark should be made on this tree. He will return home and live with his family for a long, long time. Now, when the end of the war was around the corner, he wanted more and more to experience a happy life, to get an opportunity to work fruitfully. Palmer was suddenly seized by a burning, passionate desire to see his wife. 
A deep excitement was reflected on his face. His pensive brown eyes looked into the misty, snowy distance, as if searching for someone there. Yes, this damned war has taken its toll on everyone, thought Palmer. Once in a deep mine I fed rats out of pity that they were doomed to eternal darkness, and today I did not spare a blonde Hitlerite. You've grown callous, Gonza. You've long ago become different from what you used to be. There are so many incomprehensible things around. Now they call those who kill people heroes, and after the war those who kill will be considered murderers. Did I kill my enemies out of necessity? Haven't you ever killed at will? Why don't you admit it? Yes, I've killed out of compassion for those who will never know the joy of life again. I have killed because I avenged the cries of children, the terrible groans of tortured men and dishonoured women. I killed because I saw the cold smoke over the ruins of thousands of towns and villages. I saw the ruined Russian land. That's why I killed. I killed because I hated the fascists who brought so much misery to the world. Take this, you bastard. I shouted and rejoiced when there was one less fascist. When we started to fight, there was no cruelty in us. It was taught to us by the enemies themselves. And there is no mercy for these barbarians, though death has never been my trade. Palmer shook off the weight of memories and began buttoning his tunic and overcoat, getting ready to go downstairs. And at that moment the irreparable happened. There was a sharp sound somewhere nearby, and a dull pain pierced his chest. A paralysing spark ran down my spine and shot barbed needles down my legs and left arm. Pain pierced his entire body. Palmer sank first to his knees and then collapsed his entire body to the ground. Palmer lay on his right side. There was a look of surprise in his eyes. He did not immediately realize what had happened to him. Gradually his consciousness returned to him and he tried to get up, but he could not even move as his legs and left arm would not obey him. There was still strength in his right arm, but not enough to move his heavy, limp body closer to the weapon. Struggling to lift his head, Palmer looked around to the insidious assassin, but saw no one. His mind went back to what had happened. It became clear to him that his legs and arm were immobile. He was conscious of what it meant and what now awaited him. This is a state that a man can experience only once in his life, just before the end. He had always hoped to avoid it, and just today his faith in it had grown stronger. He pushed away the thought that he was in a bad way. With his healthy hand he felt a still part of his body, and it seemed to him as if it belonged not to him but to someone else. He wanted to shout, but instead of shouting there was a hoarse cough, and his uniform coat at his chin turned red with blood. Then he realized everything, and he was seized with rage. If he could, he would have shouted at the top of his voice the harshest curses that had ever been uttered in the mine. The pain of realizing his doom was so acute and physically palpable that it shackled him completely. For a time he gave in to the feeling, but then little by little he began to realize that there was no point in fighting for a life that was irrevocably passing away. Now Palmer lay on his back and looked up, where flakes of snow flickered against the trees. The snowflakes, slowly swirling, lay on the ground. When the snowflakes hit Palmer's eyes, he closed them. But the snowflakes melted, and he could see everything around him again. Then it began to seem as if all the flakes of snow were flying straight at him, all the paths of their flight ending in him. He was frightened at the thought that they were going to pelt him alive. Now the calm snowfall didn't fill him with quiet joy as it had not so long ago. If only he could reach his hand to the automatic, his heart clenched with a sharp pain. In the wide open eyes glowed longing. I didn't want to think about anything else. But how can you make a dying man stop thinking? Palmer's agitated brain worked feverishly, endeavouring in his last moments which were becoming fewer and fewer to imagine what he was losing in this world. No longer would he live with the family he had so ardently longed for so recently. Nothing of what people enjoy. He will no longer be able to know. Nothing, absolutely nothing. The chilling sense of loneliness seized him. His throat constricted with spasms. Drops of cold sweat appeared on his face. His breathing became heavy and hoarse. An unbearable pain spread throughout his body. Tear it squeezed his chest, came to his throat. Consciousness began to fog. For a moment he listened to the beating of his heart. Droplets of sweat dripped from his face and a terrible weakness spread through his body. He had never thought of dying like this. A strong thirst reminded him of the flask. With his right hand he pulled it out of his overcoat pocket with difficulty, slowly and clumsily unscrewed the cork and pressed the neck to his mouth. The caddy jumped several times, 
The wounded man coughed and groaned loudly. He was so weak that the hand with the flask slipped and the vodka ran down his collar. Then he drew the flask back to his thirsty mouth and downed it in large gulps. A pleasant warm wave spread through his aching body. The bitter tragedy of dying slowly gave way to indifference. Palmer's head, thrown back, rested on a fallen tree branch. Looking at his body, he saw that it was half covered with snow. Only the lapels of his overcoat and the toes of his boots protruded as dark islands among the white shroud. There was a calmness of mind. It's all over with you, he thought, with a peaceful sigh. Everyone has to go through that. Take things as they really are. Considering that you, Gonza, fought in such a scorcher for almost five years, you were lucky. After the war was over, we were going to run the state according to the laws of justice. No offence to be taken, valuing human life. But then came the thought that it was already over for him. He looked sorrowfully at his large, reliable hands which now lay powerlessly along his body. Yes, dying is a lousy thing, especially if it takes a long time and you're alone, Palmer complained. It's worse to die when there's still hope, and when there's no hope, it's easier like mine. At such a moment, when everything is clear and nothing can be changed, it is useless to feel sorry for yourself. After all, life is not always the highest virtue. He calmed down a little, looked around, glanced up at the dark grey sky where large flakes of snow were falling. Then, with the fingers of his right hand, he pulled pine needles out from under the snow, grabbed a full handful and lightly touched the bark of the tree. Greedily, he inhaled the resinous odour. It reminded him of the forests of Beskneim and the mines of Ostras. His whole life flashed before him. He remembered one Sunday. He was lying in a forest bog on the brown earth, strewn with needles and biting off the soft end of a stalk of grass. Through the crowns of the trees he could see the sky. A cloud appeared. It covered for a moment a blue piece of sky and immediately disappeared behind the trees. Palmer closed his eyes. He felt that his strength was leaving him. Goosebumps ran down his face. Everything inside seemed petrified. He breathed often and moaned softly, as if crying out for mercy to the approaching death. The words of his favourite commander and teacher suddenly rang in his ears. You are only as great as the burden you carry. One last time he woke up once more from his fainted state, and the thought flashed through his mind. I wasn't a bad soldier. Then it was over. The report of the Supreme Command of the Soviet Army of 24 November 1944 stated. The units of the 1st Seiko-Slovak Army Corps in the USSR eliminated the last pockets of enemy resistance on the southern exits from the Dukla Pass and began to pursue the German fascist troops in the Ondava direction. Sub-Lieutenant Jan Palmer, like many of his comrades, died for free Seiko-Czechoslovakia on 2000 November 1944 on an unnamed height south of the village of Nizhny Komarnik. Was it nameless?